Good afternoon, Lisa Montegia, Dr. Lisa Montegia. You are a um, associate professor of psychiatry at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and also a winner of IMRO's Rising Star Award for Basic Research for 2011. Congratulations. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well, thank you. Good, good. So um, I wanted to ask you several questions, well, uh, not a, a few questions about your research for um, our viewers, but I wanted to start out by asking you um, uh, how you first got involved in neuroscience. Now, you told me it was kind of a, a roundabout approach, how you got involved in neuroscience, and it's been a strength for you since then. Uh, can you explain a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so I actually uh, started off, my first exposure to neuroscience was actually in a pharmaceutical company. And so I actually uh, was working in a drug discovery unit, and my background prior to that had been more in molecular cellular aspects. Actually, my training had been in microbiology with an emphasis on molecular cellular biology. And it was uh, an industry thrown together with many different scientists. I was first exposed to neuroscience. And it was very exciting, but it was also a little bit overwhelming. And I was very fortunate uh, to be able to obtain my PhD while continuing to work in research. So my PhD is in an academic environment, and I was able to pursue that while I remained an uh, uh, industry employee. So it actually really was wonderful training to see how two different aspects work. And so my uh, neuroscience, like I said, really came by more association, really liking the types of questions that were being asked, and really um, being used in a sort of, um, be, being put in an industry environment to really stimulate types of discussions. So exposure to pharmacologists, electrophysiologists, behaviorists, chemists, it really was quite unique to be able to find so many different ways to approach a problem at such an early stage of my career. That sounds exciting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Great, and uh, it's, it, I, I can see it's kind of carried through, and, and you've made a lot of progress since you started. Um, you've, um, you're working right now with a drug called ketamine, and mm -hmm. uh, you found um, that at very small doses, you can tell us a bit about this, at small doses it acts as a very rapid acting antidepressant. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, can you explain a little bit about how you started to work with ketamine? Mm -hmm. So actually, the initial findings on ketamine as a fast-acting antidepressant came from the clinic. Came from the clinic. Uh, there had been work that had shown that very small, low-dose ketamine could produce rapid antidepressant responses within a couple of hours in patients that were treatment-resistant. So this is a very exciting finding, and it's been replicated. It appeared to be, uh, a, you know, a very exciting but also perplexing finding in the sense that traditional antidepressants work on the serotonin system. Mm -hmm. And ketamine actually works on a different system, glutamate. It blocks ionotropic NMDA receptors. And so it was very intriguing to think that you could generate a fast-acting antidepressant response by not targeting serotonin or norepinephrine, another common uh, transmitter, but actually glutamate. Sort of the caveat, though, was that it was ketamine that produced the effect. And ketamine is a drug that's been around for a long time at, at very high doses. It's an anesthetic. But it's also an abuse drug. The street name is Special K. And so you have to worry about administering ketamine. Are there going to be any sort of potential abuse liabilities or psychomimetic effects? In the clinic, the patients that were treated with the low-dose ketamine, it was extremely low-dose. So they didn't observe any adverse effects. But the effect, but it remains unclear, how often would you be able to give ketamine to these patients without potentially having side effects? And that's actually an active area of research. So we became intrigued just because we're targeting a different system. This is an extremely rapid antidepressant response. It not only has potential in terms of individuals with depression, but potentially with bipolar disease, even patients that, um, individuals with suicide risk. So we thought this is so broad acting. We could actually take a clinical finding and try to work backwards to understand the mechanism of action. And the ultimate goal, and this probably brings in a little bit of my industry background, was that if we can identify the mechanism by which ketamine is producing its fast-acting antidepressant response, 
You might be able to trigger that mechanism, generate a fast-acting antidepressant response without the side effects associated with ketamine. Awesome. So that's our initial interest. Okay, and uh, so um, so so far you you've made some discoveries, at least in one discovery that you've reported on uh, with, with regards to how ketamine does work and do its work, and it, it's mm -hmm. related to a protein in the brain called BDNF or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, mm -hmm. What did you learn about BDNF with regards to well, with regards to ketamine and how it works? And and give us a little background on BDNF and, and its role in the brain as well, please. So we started off our initial study is trying to understand how ketamine was working, and so we did the initial studies to show that it actually was blocking these glutamate receptors. And the question though is what happens downstream of that? And we and other groups had shown that BDNF this growth factor was required for traditional antidepressants to work. If you deleted this growth factor in preclinical models, then traditional antidepressants could not produce an antidepressant effect. So we asked, could ketamine work in a similar mechanism? And it does, in the sense that if you delete BNA, you do not produce an antidepressant response to ketamine. Now, the ketamine response is very rapid, where a traditional antidepressant actually takes much longer. What's interesting is that traditional antidepressants take quite a while to regulate BDNF levels, where ketamine did it very, very quickly, hmm. within 30 minutes. And so it sort of made the antidepressant effect. So it really started us down a pathway of trying to elucidate what is this growth factor doing, why is it required, and how is the changes in BDNF, which can have very profound effects on synaptic plasticity, plasticity changes in your brain, how is that contributing to these changes that may produce the long-term effects of this drug, the long-term being, you know, 10 to 14 days. So what we hope is that by understanding the role of BDNF, we sort of found the initial segue into, like, how ketamine is producing this antidepressant effects. So we still have a lot of work to do. We think we have, again, a mechanism as a starting point to really hone in and figure out how we can trigger a fast-acting antidepressant response. And it has clear you know, clinical application. There's such a need for a faster acting antidepressant across many patient populations. So by taking our initial findings and now building on them with funding from MRO, we're hoping to really understand the neural circuitry that's involved. Where, for example, is BDNF median its effect? What is the neural circuitry? And trying to get at more fundamental questions as we go to really be able to understand how these drug is producing its effect and to really contribute to the next stage of drug development. More power to you. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Last, uh, th that's really exciting stuff. And uh, I know it's going to help a lot of people out there when you finally figure out what, you know, exactly how ketamine does what it does and you can apply it to, you know, new therapies coming out for, for um, bipolar and for depression. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Montesia, for doing the work that you do. Yeah, I mean, we really, really hope that this will have a clinical implication. We're really driven about this. We feel very passionate about this. We really hope that it translates to clinical advance. Okay, me too. Thanks for appearing on Brainwaves today, Lisa. Thank you, Brandon, for having me. You're welcome.